Good evening. I'm Henry Jackson, pastor of Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church at 1667 South Lauderdale Street in Memphis, Tennessee. Welcome to our Thursday night Bible study. We're studying the subject of what defiles a person. And specifically, we're looking at the idea of sensuality. Our text comes from Mark chapter 7, verse 14 through 23, and it reads, And he called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside of a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of a person are what defiles him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him? Since it enters not into his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled. And he said, What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, and this week, sensuality. And also we'll follow up in the coming weeks with envy and slander and pride and foolishness. And Jesus says, all of these things come from within and they defile the man. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for bringing us together again for this uh, opportunity to study your word. We pray now that you were to give the increase that your word will come alive in our hearts and that we may grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that we will walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the Bible, sensuality is usually listed with other evils that include sexual promiscuity and perversion, which is also known as lewdness. Sensuality can be defined as devotion to gratifying bodily appetites. I'll say that again. Sensuality can be defined as devotion to gratifying bodily appetites. Free indulgence in carnal pleasure. David, uh, King David, charged his son Solomon in First Chronicles, uh, chapter twenty-eight, uh, and verse nine. He says, in essence, and I paraphrase it. He says, "For the Lord searches all hearts and understands every plan and thought." In other words, God knows exactly what's in us. And he knows our thoughts from afar off. And if there's anybody that's able to, to get our uh, uh, thoughts and our plans that come out of the heart that are evil in check, then it must be God, especially since he made us. What's in each of us was put there or was there from birth. And with age, it matures. And one day, it comes out if we haven't matured as Christians. Psalms 51 verse 5 says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. That must be why Paul, not Paul, but uh, Job said in chapter 5, he said, uh, We were born unto trouble. In other words, a lifetime of trouble was here waiting on us when we arrived. And partly it must have been because of the fact that we were shaped in iniquity and conceived in sin. And those things are what brings uh, troubles into our lives. And, 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 and all of the time, it's not sin that causes us to have to go through some things, but sin does bring about an opportunity for sin to cause us to be looked upon as filthy rags in God's sight. 
Even our righteousness is seen as filthy rags. Paul provides direction for married couples in dealing with the idea of sensuality. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5, he says, Do not deprive one another except perhaps by agreement for a limited time, that you may devote yourself to prayer. But then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I wish I had more time to go into that. Uh, uh, in other words, Paul is saying, uh, husband and wife should work together uh, so that you won't give Satan an opportunity to tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Self-control is one of those words that that, that further defines sensuality, allowing the flesh to take over and control you. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 32, and I'll read a few verses of that because he's dealing with uh, unmarried uh, individuals. He says, I want you to be free from anxiety. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife. And his interests are divided. And an unmarried woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy and in body and in spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, on how to please her husband. And he says, I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraints upon you. In other words, Paul is saying, I'm not trying to cramp your style. I'm not trying to put a heavy yoke upon you. I'm giving you this to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. In other words, I'm going to give you what you need to have yourself under control. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25 says, Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. And all things include their diet, include their sleep habits, include their exercise, their preparation to, for competition. And we as, as uh, Christians should exercise self-control in all things. It says, athletes do this for a perishable wreath on the head. That was during the Roman days when, when, when the winner would receive a wreath on his head. But Paul says, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly and I do not box as one beating the air. In other words, Paul says, I'm not running in place. I'm not running and going nowhere. Or I do not shadow box with the air, trying to hit somebody that's not there. But I discipline my body and keep it under control. And that's what we as Christians must learn to do. Galatians 5 and 17 and I read a few verses of this says, For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. Flesh, For they oppose each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. That must be why Paul said, The things I want to do, I do not. And the things I don't want to do, that's what I do. And he goes on to say, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of sin? I thank God through Christ Jesus. Paul finds deliverance, and we all can find deliverance when we are submissive to the will of God through Christ Jesus and the Holy Spirit. He goes on in verse 19 to say, Now the works of the flesh are evident, and here's how they're evident. When we give way to sexual immorality, impurities, sensual, sensual, sensuality, uh, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, 
rivalry, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, orgies, or things like these. He says, I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 23 says, uh, well, let's go with verse 22 also. But the fruits of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness, and gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. And by the way, the verses that I use, the version that I'm using most often is the English Standard Version. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 says, For God gives us not, he, he gives us not the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of self-control. Now, I know we've heard that verse uh, quoted a lot lately, and you hear uh, instead of uh, self-control, you say here, a sound mind, having a sound mind, being settled. And in other words, where Paul says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Jesus had a sound mind and nothing that Satan tried gave him the upper hand or the ability to pull Jesus away from God. And we've got to uh, work at being obedient to God, even unto death. And only by the power of God can we do that. But it is doable. Godliness in the last days, Paul says to Timothy, he says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, he said, but understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulties or perilous times, the King James Version says. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. And he goes on to say, avoid such people. We should work at making our calling and election sure. For Second Peter uh, chapter 1 verse 3 says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them we might become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement or add to support your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he's blind, having forgotten that he has been clean or cleansed from his former or her former sins. In the New Testament, sensual indicates man's subjection to self or self-interest. The selfish man in whom the spirit is degraded into subordination to the soul. Sensual is life according to one's physical appetite. 
desires rather than in obedience to the Holy Spirit. First Peter 2 and 2 says, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. That's something that we should desire that's for the spirit instead of desiring what's craved or desired by the flesh. James chapter 3 verse 15 explains to us that sensual wisdom is that which is in harmony with and springs from the corrupt desires of our hearts. Jude 19 says, it is these who cause division, people, these people who cause division, they're worldly people. They're devoid of the spirit of God. Solomon was an individual that tried everything that his heart desired, and he discovered that all is vanity. Everything is empty and worthless. There's a hymn that uh, we don't uh, spend much time with by Dr. Isaac Watt. It, it says, how vain are all things here below. Love to the creature is dangerous. How vain are all things here below. How false and yet how, yet how fair. Each pleasure hath it's poison too, and every sweet snare, the brightest thing below the sky, gives but a flattering light. And we should suspect some danger is nigh, where we take delight. Let me end with uh, sharing with you uh, what uh, one person that really can give us some advice, a great lesson in fighting sensuality. It's King David. You remember he had the episode with Bathsheba and in that he went to God in prayer. Let me see if I can find it right quick. Psalms 51. David cries out to God as a remedy for his situation. He says, and th this is about a clean heart. He says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgression, wash me thoroughly from mine iniquities and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your word and blameless in your judgment. Behold, uh, he, he goes on to say, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, look at me. He says, You delight in truth in the inward part, and you teach me wisdom in the secret places of my heart. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean, and wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness, and let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide not your face from my sins, and blot out all of my iniquities. And here it is, verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God and renew a right spirit within me. And that's phase one of what we need to do for receiving a clean heart. But then believe what, what Jesus did, how he shed his blood on Calvary one Friday. 
out of his side flowed blood like water where sinners can plunge beneath and lose their guilty stain. And early the third day morning, after being in the grave three days, he rose with all power, power to save to the utmost. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for another opportunity to study your word. We pray now that you would give the increase that we would be better and more useful in your service. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So long, until next time.